Um, thanks to everyone for coming this morning. Uh, last week, the OECD, the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, that's a sort of rich countries club, released its report of its predictions for the world economy until 2060. Uh, how much store you can put really on a prediction for the next 40, 60 years of capitalism, uh, I don't really know. But well, it doesn't really matter whether uh, that's true in detail or not. What it does show is the extreme pessimism among people right at the top of society about where capitalism is going. Uh, it said that growth will slow to around two-thirds of its current rate, that inequality will increase massively, and there's a big risk that climate change will make things much worse even than that. So the future, uh, promised by those who support capitalism, is hardly a rosy prospect. Uh, you know, at one time, it would have been said that growth would continue in a massive way, that people's lives would be transformed, that we would become to a more equal society, a more just society, and that things would get better. Uh, that's not what's being promised at all, and that's the best prospect that's put forward. And it's important uh, because, of course, it's the background to the attacks that are coming upon the working class. And in many sense, that's the biggest challenge that all of us face inside the working class movement and on the left. Not that the rich face the same problems. I mean, just to highlight one statistic, the Dow Jones Index, which is the index of uh, United States shares, hit a low point of 6,500 in March of 2009 following the crash. Uh, it recently went through 17,000, um, a 250% increase since 2009. Not based, of course, on massive growth inside the American economy, but based on the fact that huge amounts of money have been pumped into the banks, into the financial instrument houses, and that they are looking for places to invest it. They don't want to invest in industry and in services because they're not sure they can make a profit for it and therefore huge amounts have gone into stocks and speculation uh, perhaps creating the conditions for a further crash by the way uh, but both of those show the features of long-term worsening inequality and the attacks that are going to come as a result on the working class uh, in britain uh, both of these are very clear the rich continue to soar ahead, I don't have to evidence that to anyone, and we know that the cuts have only just begun. Uh, that, uh, according to the Institute of Public Policy Research, that uh, only 40% of the cuts that the Tories want to implement have been implemented, another 60% to come after the general election. And we also know that the Labour Party has committed itself essentially to the same programme. So what we may say with some certainty is that the economy will remain stagnant or with very low levels of growth, that any fruits of growth will be delivered to those at the top of society, and that huge attacks are going to continue upon the working class. Good news for a Sunday morning. Um, it's in that context that the 10th of July strike was so important. I should say about the strike, incidentally, the ruling class and its media have only two registered about any class strike in society. One is uh, that it's completely ineffective, uh, the other is it's holding the country to ransom. Um, uh, they managed on the 10th of July to say both. Um, it was a strike where not a single bin failed to be collected, not a school cl class was closed, uh, not a single doll claimant failed to be harassed. Uh, and yet at the same time, we need massive new anti-strike laws to stop this sort of thing happening again. Uh, it shows the unease amongst the ruling class about the mood that exists in society. That even if not expressed in official terms, that they know that many millions of people have deeply bitter feelings towards those who are at the top of society after years, years of pay cuts and other attacks upon working conditions and living conditions, and that there are millions of people who are really suffering as a result of the austerity programs that's been implemented and will continue to be implemented. Uh, a powder cake inside society that they are worried that will find a focus. Of course, the problem has been for many years that there has been no official focus from the trade union movement. Very, very important local strikes, Lambeth College strike, KUK strike, Yorkshire Ambulance, 
strike, the SOAS cleaners strike, the Ealing Hospital workers strike, a whole number we could talk about, but uh, in terms of a big movement of the union since the sellout of early December 2011 after the magnificent pension strike, there has not been that same level of coordinated action which could pose a real problem towards the Tories. Now the 10th of July begins to show a glimpse of how that can change. It's only a beginning, but my goodness what an important beginning. Uh, a strike that got a very high level of public support, both expressed in terms of opinion polls, 58% of people for example said that they supported the trade union's demand for an extra one pound an hour, uh, and in terms of the reality of what happened when you were on the picket lines and on the rallies, people applauding the strikers, people joining the rallies in large numbers and so on. And one of the key things I want to say today is that if we are going to change the situation in Britain, a higher level of struggle is very, very important towards achieving that. Uh, it makes a whole number of other things possible. If we had a higher level of struggle, uh, the possibilities around pushing back against racist scapegoating, the potential of electoral formations to the left of Labour, the possibility of a bigger socialist organisation at the heart of it, all of those prospects would be massively increased by the higher level of struggle. And therefore the 10th of July is important, the success of it needs to be proclaimed. There was a lot of fear inside the trade union leaderships about how successful the strike would be. It was a successful strike and now uh, we have to fight very hard to make sure that it's not thrown away. We have to fight very, very hard to make sure that there is pressure on the trade union leaders to achieve a return to a level of struggle at least as high as 10th of July or higher if possible in short order. Uh, that we want it possible to happen in September, the trade union unison has talked about just, uh, two further days of strikes in the middle of September. That has to be a target where we push every trade union to join in on that, those days. If we were to see the 10th of July not merely repeated but at a higher level in the middle of September, there would be a genuine challenge towards the pay policy of the coalition and more generally to the austerity programmes of the government. It would also be a tremendous beacon towards lots of other people inside society. Uh, the idea that we can fight, we can win, the trade unions have something relevant to say to us would be important towards drawing many younger people who are not presently members of union into the trade union movement. It would be a sign to those people on zero hour contracts or on the minimum wage that there was a potential to fight and to win in society. And therefore, this is one of the key political battles to make sure that we don't have a repeat of 2011. And the organisation in which we are involved, Unite the Resistance, has to play an important part in doing that. You see, the basis for Unite the Resistance is seen on those rallies on the 10th of July. Uh, let's pluck one out there. Leeds. Uh, Leeds had uh, 5,000 people on the rally. Uh, would one in 10 of those people, that's 500 people, would one in 10 of them be interested in coming, getting together with other workers, talking about how we take the struggle forward, putting pressure on the union leaders, making sure there isn't a sell out by the union bureaucracy and so on, I think they would be interested in getting together to do those sort of things. To give solidarity to other strikes, to, to help workers move forward. That's uh, the basis of what we want to do around United Resistance. Uh, we want to have the capacity to bring networks of people together with sections of the trade union leaderships who are prepared to fight, but also to create at the base of the unions a pressure on people at the top of the unions not to squander the opportunities and for us to give as rank and file workers solidarity and so far as is possible to take initiatives ourselves without having to rely on the trade union officials. Now I think of that 5,000 in Leeds, there probably were 500 who were interested in that. Uh, and now you can go around any rally in the country and I think one in ten is probably quite a modest number of people. The difficult thing is getting them in a room. Uh, that's not easy. Uh, that's not easy at all. But we have to try to do it. And you know, you can't will the end without willing the means. Uh, if we actually want to ramp up pressure on the people at the top of the unions, you have to organise. You have to get motions put into trade union branches, into trade union regions, and put pressure on the TUC and on the union bureaucracies. 
and therefore we have to try and find a mechanism for it. I'm not saying it's easy, but if we don't try to do it, it certainly ain't going to happen. And in that case, we will not be able to find a lever to stop the potential sellouts that are coming. And let's be honest about it, there will be a political battle about whether there is further action after the 10th of July. It's not going to fall into our lap. I mean, the only one that has definitely talked about it is Unison, and the danger is that Unison then, then says, well, we would have done it, but we're a bit isolated now, so we're having second thoughts. It will take heavy pressure, and it, but we have to try and do it. It's not the greatest time of the year, because the union movement goes to sleep in August, to be honest. But we, if we don't make the, uh, the, the effort to change the mood around this, to stop the union bureaucrats pulling back from it, then uh, we can be in trouble. We have to use the good signs that have come from some sections of the bureaucracy to put uh, pressure on others and to insist that those who say they want to fight go ahead with that, even if they are not supported in the first instance by others. And in addition, uh, part of that, another important element going into the autumn is the TUC demonstration on the 18th of October. Uh, the TUC is called a demonstration, Britain needs a pay rise, it's a good slogan, uh, there's a deep feeling inside society that we're all being ripped off, that our wages have all been held down for too long, it's a potential to have hundreds of thousands of people on the streets in London on the 18th of October, but we have a vision of what 18th of October should be like. 18th of October should be part of and adding to a rise in the level of struggle inside society. What we don't want is for the line of march to be 10 July, 18th of October, general election, but with nothing in between those <coughs> elements. And there is a danger that that can happen. Now we have to fight to build the 18th of October, it's incredibly important that when we leave Marxism, we straight away start uh, talking about the 18th of October with uh, communities and uh, trade union activists around us. Because the trade union movement is slow. You know, we're socialists and revolutionaries. If necessary, we can get a demonstration sorted out in three days. Or three hours, if necessary. The TUC does not march. At that point. Uh, you know, the TUC has given itself uh, an emergency demonstration of uh, October uh, to go for. Uh, and it takes time to get the motions through the trade unions and all the rest of it, and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the, the transport and all the rest of it. It's very, very important that that is a huge demonstration. It will lift people's confidence. But it will be not half so effective if it isn't surrounded by a rising level of strikes and struggle. Uh, it will feel a, a little bit lacking of uh, the real cutting edge if it doesn't have those. Otherwise, it can just become simply a thing saying, aren't the Tories wonderful, and look over there, there's an election coming up. And, you know, of course, the demonstration is important anyway, but we have to fight for the cuts to be part of it. And part of that package as well is to say that if this level of struggle rises, then it can draw in much wider layers of people who are fighting back. Of course we need, don't we? Specific campaigns around things like the bedroom tax and against the attacks on benefits. Uh, Benefit Justice is having a uh, day of action on the 11th of September, for example. Very, very important. Uh, that we support those. But they will also be much, much stronger if they can be brought around the rising level of struggle by organised workers. This is one of the excellent initiatives and ideas that's been seized on, for example, by DPAC, Disabled People Against Cuts, who recognised from an early stage that they would have to have their own activities, and they're brilliant in what they've done, but have also firmly placed themselves alongside organised workers in struggle. And it's made them 10 or 20 times more effective because they are an integral part of the cutting edge where workers are at their strongest, withdrawing their labour, attacking the profits of the other side. This is how the rise in struggle can be so important in terms of the attack. We know as well that there is that deep feeling for unity of the cuts campaigns and workers fighting back. The, the, the theme of unity, let's all fight together, is incredibly popular. One of the reasons why the People's Assembly demonstration on the 21st of June was such a big demonstration. Uh, it was a successful demonstration, a big demonstration, because people thought, here's an opportunity for us all to come together. And in our localities, we have to think about the People's Assemblies and make sure that we are taking part in its activities, building its activities, 
going along to its meetings and its events, and also taking part in the discussions inside it. Uh, the great thing about any People's Assembly meeting that takes place in the next few months is that the backdrop to it will be the 10th of July strike. And it will be a great place to have the discussion about how all of us can move the movement forwards. And, of course, the people at the top of the People's Assembly do not share our politics. That's the truth. I understand that. But the audience is our audience. The people in the room are the people who have very, very similar views to ourselves. I was struck on the demonstration in London on the 21st of June, uh, how many young people there were on it, that there were workers on it, that there were people who responded very enthusiastically to the sorts of ideas we put forward about the importance of the 10th of July and then the requirement to move forward afterwards. We need an argument inside the People's Assembly, but we can't stand apart from it in a sectarian manner or denounce it as some sort of sellout or removal from the uh, real struggle that's going on. This is an important arena for us to be involved in. We have to be part of it and we also have to be taking and argue the sorts of arguments that I've made about how we take the struggle forward. Part of that discussion inside the People's Assembly will also be about the Labour Party because it has never been clearer that Labour is not going to change things after the election. Well, that's not quite true, is it? There will be some small changes that Miliband will promise. Uh, because of the campaign, he's been forced to pledge to get rid of the bedroom tax. Although he hasn't said he'd get rid of the arrears and all those sorts of questions which need to be raised very strongly as well. Uh, he said that there will be a house building programme. He said that there will be a cap on energy prices. Uh, all fairly carefully calibrated, most of them, to make sure they don't cost the government any money, by the way. But, you know, that's... Uh, something that they've worked on quite hard. However, in terms of the big picture, it's obvious that very, very little is being promised. Um, Chris Leslie, the Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, who is the person who will police expenditure if uh, he keeps his job when, if Labour gets into office, made a recent speech where he said, the settlements we will need to make following the general election will be the toughest faced by an incoming Labour government for a generation. <coughs> he went on to say that it would be very foolish for ministers to start promising that they were going to have large increases in expenditure. Indeed, they were having a zero-cost review where everything was uh, in the balance. Everything had to be looked at, every penny had to be examined, and that Labour was not going to promise to put forward anything different. And that general feeling, along with, uh, combined with the sort of idiotic things that Miliband does, like posing with the sun, you know, uh, which is such a symbol, actually, of both incompetence and their enthrall, <coughs> how much enthralled they are to elements of the ruling class, has, I think, caused deep disquiet amongst <coughs> large numbers of workers inside society. Large numbers of people look at the Labour Party and say, is that really going to make my life any better. And of course Labour is ahead in the polls, but not by very much. And not with a very high figure either. I mean, you know, they're around 36, 38% in most of the polls. Given what the Tories have done to people in Britain, that's really quite a low figure. Really quite a low figure. Um, and therefore, I, you know, my, my guess, I don't think this is the official position of the Central Committee, I will make my own personal uh, <laughs> prediction here, is I think Labour will win the next election. Uh, but nonetheless, you wouldn't guarantee uh, that that will occur. And it seems to me that uh, there will be uh, a real discussion about what Labour is or isn't going to deliver for people. And that raises a whole number of questions. It also means that other political forces can emerge to try and batten onto the disquiet in society. And one of those is undoubtedly UKIP. Uh, UKIP has emerged as a real threat. And... This isn't, by the way, cut off from what I've spoken about in terms of the level of struggle. One of the reasons UKIP has risen is precisely because of the low level of struggle. Uh, you see, uh, the unions produce excellent figures. Unison produced a whole raft of figures uh, showing the cuts in wages that had happened since the coalition came to power. Now, they show that for most public sector workers, it's 18 or 20 percent fall in real living standards when you take into inflation uh, since the coalition came to power. That's a shocking figure. 
Just one question though, what were the unions doing while all this was happening? Um, you know, not, not enough happened. And because of that, uh, there is that feeling inside society of a gap where there ought to be filled by struggle and positive alternatives. The lack of that has made it easier for UK. And in addition, all of the main party leaderships have engaged in racist scapegoating of one form or another, whether it be the Tories openly pushing through attacks on migrants, increased Islamophobia, the disgusting attack on the Birmingham schools by Michael Gove, whether it be the Lib Dems voting through all these things while wringing their hands, or the Labour leadership saying the biggest mistake of the last government was not to be hard enough on immigration and saying that they are certainly going to tackle this uh, if they get into 10 Downing Street. The rise of UKIP is a real threat both electorally, imagining what it would be like if they did get a number of MPs, how that would enable them to have even greater influence and if they had, God, if they had an MP they'd be continually on the BBC judging by how much <laughs> Farage gets. Um, it's an electoral threat but there's also that general pull to the right inside politics, which is actually the most dangerous thing about them. Even if they never win a council, or if they never win an MP, that pull towards racism, which is being lapped up by sections of the Tory party and the other parties, is the biggest danger that they pose towards us. And of course, they are building themselves on the racism that was rolled out by the Tories and others. UKIP was able to harvest the crops on the ground seeded by the Tories and their allies around the question of racism. So, we've got to do something about UKIP. We've already started, we know this. Stand Up to UKIP has been, was formed before the European elections. I'm very glad we did it. It meant that there was a response against Farage at the meetings he did. That there were people who stood up and attacked him. There were people who demonstrated outside and labelled them clearly as being racist. Very, very important. We have to develop that work now. We have to make sure that there is a big turnout from all over the country on the 27th of September in Doncaster. Because we're going to the UKIP conference to say that we're standing up against UKIP, we're standing up against racism, we're standing up against homophobia, and we're standing up against the anti-working class policies that UKIP puts forward, that we're going to unmask UKIP not as the people's army but as the boss's army that seeks to divide the working class and to stop people fighting back and to enable capital to be stronger against ordinary people in society. And the 27th of September demonstration will only work if in every locality we take round the statements, we get people to sign it, we get it into local press, we call a meeting of people who want to build for the demonstration and build a movement bigger than ourselves and our immediate mates in order to get a, a campaign going against UKIP. Drawing in Labour councillors, Green councillors, uh, people of no party, people inside the trade unions, inside the LGBT organisations, all of this important because the number of people who are supported at the top of the unions is fantastic. You know, once Len McCluskey signs something, it opens a lot of doors, uh, to be honest. It's very helpful to get those sorts of signatures. But not just uh, trade unionists, also cultural figures, people uh, in anti-racist movement, people in uh, immigrant workers groups and so on. We have to do that on a local level. We have to replicate it in our areas and build from that a big turnout on the demonstrations on the 27th of September. And if the 18th of October demonstration isn't far away, the 27th of September is closer. Brilliant. Um, Therefore, uh, you have to do it quickly. Uh, we have to get the coaches booked and move forward around that. It's very, very important uh, to do that. There's another day in September which is important, which is the 18th of September, which is the Scottish referendum. Now, obviously, this matters most to the Scots, but actually, politically, it's something of immense importance. Immense importance. I mean, it's interesting that Cameron had to deny that he would resign if he lost the referendum because he knew it would be a guarantee <laughs> that large numbers of people would vote yes if they thought all I have to do is vote yes and Cameron will go. That's really very easy, isn't it? Now, this is not a referendum about David Cameron, therefore, he had to say. Now, I'm not going to resign. But actually, if he lost the referendum, it would be a political earthquake 
uh, for the British ruling class. Uh, you know, Salmond, whatever his weakness is, and Salmond is essentially uh, a neoliberal leading a neoliberal party, if Salmond, for all his weaknesses, would be forced to serve the notice of eviction on Trident uh, and say it's got to go. Uh, the British ruling class don't want that. Um, they don't want to feel that their reach in the world is being reduced. They don't want to feel that the state is being broken up. And therefore, uh, we're voting yes, we're campaigning for yes, we're pushing very, very hard in Scotland about this, and we're also asking comrades from England and Wales to go up to Scotland uh, on the weekend before the referendum to take part in some of the campaigning around it. The, I called it in the Scottish meeting the International Brigade yesterday. It's not quite that. <laughs> <laughs> <No, that's, laughs> the, the idea that we're going to fight uh, the battle uh, alongside them uh, in the uh, streets of Glasgow, Edinburgh, Dundee, Aberdeen, uh, I mean, let's not go too far north, anyway, uh, but in the big places, which are a bit closer. Uh, and actually, having done a bit of it, it's fantastically exciting to be in Scotland at the moment. It's infusing political debate. Um, the era of the mass meeting has returned in Scotland. Tommy Sheridan has done a tour in which he's spoken to 14,000 people that in, mass me in you know, public meetings. Uh, that's quite impressive. And it's a left-wing uh, movement that's taking place. It's not about narrow nationalism or we hate the English or we, you know, there are of course sections of the nationalist movement like that. The dominant thing inside it is against austerity, it's against imperialism, it's against the idea that uh, we must uh, accept that there can be no change and there can be no better society than this. It's a very, very important political development that's taking place inside Scotland. Uh, more generally, uh, when I think politically about things, uh, the general election of May 2015 is extremely important. Uh, and one of the things we are going to do is to stand as part of the Trade Unionist and Socialist Coalition uh, some candidates from the Socialist Workers' Party. Uh, I think it is a disgrace, really, that we have such a fragmented left in Britain, uh, that we ought to be able to have a stronger united left of Labour alternative on the ballot on the May elections next year. Uh, I'm glad to say that we argued inside the task that there should be an approach towards left unity, uh, saying we'd like you to come inside task and stand as part of that, but if you don't feel like that, uh, then we should discuss starting with something new that's neither task nor left unity, that we can have a united umbrella for all of us. Uh, regrettably, left unity don't think that's a good idea. Uh, but I think we have to keep working for it. We have to keep saying it is crazy that there are competing groups that are saying they are putting forward essentially the same level of, the same sorts of policies to the left of the Labour Party. We would be much stronger if there were one organisation, both in Scotland actually and in England and Wales, that was putting forward an argument of saying the left has got its act together a bit, and therefore uh, we ought to be able to uh, put forward something that's powerful on the ballot box. You know, everyone says, oh, well, marvellous what happens, the Podemos, marvellous that happens in Spain. But you have to think how we get to some, some powerful uh, election alternative in Britain. Elections aren't the centrepiece of life. They really aren't. Everybody knows that what matters most is the struggle in the workplaces, the communities and the streets. We know that. But they are important. You can't ignore the elections. You can't say, well, that's official politics. I'm not interested in that. You have to put forward an alternative at election time. Uh, and the SWP is going to do that. And uh, to those of you who are members of the SWP in the room, we're going to be arguing that your area might be one of those that is going to do it. Uh, and those comrades who say, I think this is a wonderful perspective by the Central Committee, but please not here, <laughs> um, are going to find that there will be a row about that. So that's, you know, I make an open... Uh, promise that we're going to have a discussion about that. And also, if you don't feel quite up to running a uh, parliamentary candidate, there are local council elections across almost the whole of Britain except London on the same day, and we want some comrades to stand in those elections as well. This is an opportunity to put forward our views, to put forward different ideas of politics. And I'll say more generally that we have to think about being very open and very flexible uh, towards building a bigger and better left in Britain. Uh, I don't think Tusk is the uh, final answer. Um, Clive Heemskirk from the Socialist Party, who sits on the Tusk 
a steering committee <coughs> with me, recently wrote an article in which he said Tusk was a precursor at best. That's quite a good description, actually, uh, of what it could be. A precursor towards something better than that. I, I agree with Clive about that. I don't agree with Clive about everything, but I agree with him uh, about that description. It's a good description he put forward. But more generally, the SWP cannot say the only thing that matters on the left in Britain is the SWP. Uh, and the only path to a salvation comes through uh, joining the SWP. I want everybody in this room to be a member of the SWP. It's very, very important. But one of the hallmarks of us is that we reach out towards other people and look towards how the left can be stronger. And any role we can play in terms of creating a wider electoral alternative towards cooperation, <coughs> towards working together in struggle, is very, very important for the SWP to do it. We're not a sect. We're not closed off from the important movements inside society and we have to continue with working alongside other people and looking for how the, le the left can be stronger. The question of international solidarity is also going to continue to be important. We're constant, constantly in a smaller world uh, about things that are going on. The question of Palestine is an important question for us here. Uh, solidarity with Palestine uh, is incredibly important. When I read this morning that uh, the death toll is now 157 Palestinians <coughs> killed, uh, not one Israeli killed yet. Uh, the extraordinary fact that uh, ground troops are now going into Gaza. You know, this uh, attacks upon the Palestinian people, the level of suffering and murder that's taking place. We have to stand with the Palestinians just as we stood and continue to stand with the Egyptians in their struggles, just as we stood and we stand with the South African workers fighting back against the giant multinationals and the government. Uh, those, that's an important part of who we are and what we are. Uh, we're not uh, something that's focused only on the struggles in Britain. Of course, Britain is where we have to fight, where we have to fight our own ruling class, where we have to carry out the crucial bits of our work. But our vision has to be international. We have to see our sisters and brothers as those people <coughs> across the world fighting against imperialism. And we know that imperialism has demonstrated as well uh, its capacity to continually push the world towards war. Uh, and even when it faces such an appalling uh, event as the, what happened in Iraq after the invasion there, when Iraq is then thrown into crisis, the voices return again from Blair and people like that about how the solution is more bombing, another invasion, more attacks, kill more people, step up Islamophobia. And this is the response of imperialism. This is going to continue to be an important part of our work. And part of one of the things that's quite helpful is that the leaders of all the uh, main imperialist nations are coming to Wales uh, in August, uh, in Newport for the NATO summit and the demonstration on the 30th of August will be an opportunity to take our hatred of imperialism to them. So everyone's invited to go to Newport on the 30th of August. Never will Newport have seen such events. Um, well, actually. Well, the Chartist, I can <laughs> beautiful mural. Anyway, don't get me started on, on people. Um, uh, finally, I want to say uh, that all of these things that I've sp spoken about, fighting for the strikes to be extended and, and developed, uh, linking the fights to the other groups in society that are resisting, the growth of Unite the Resistance, the 18th uh, of October TUC demonstration, the 27th of September UKIP, anti-UKIP demonstration, the building of an electoral alternative to Labour, working with others on a bigger left in united in action. All of these are premised on having the SWP at the centre of it. There needs to be a revolutionary socialist organisation which knits together all the different struggles, which has an overview, not just about fighting them one at a time or in series, but of saying they're all part of a bigger battle. And that bigger battle is to give a vision and to fight for a different world dominated by profit, capital and imperialism. And to say there is a different sort of world we can have of cooperation, of peace, of people working together and of workers' power and workers' democracy, of social ownership and of the resources in society matching against the needs of society, not mediated by profit and a tiny elite at the top of society, but all of us 
working together in the interests of all. That's an important thing to say, that we can defeat racism and homophobia and women's oppression, that we can have a different world, but it becomes real in the struggle. It becomes real in the lessons that are learned in the struggle, the consciousness change that happens inside struggle, and we need a revolutionary socialist organisation which is building, which is growing, which is moving forward without saying it's the only thing that matters inside society, but without revolutionary socialist organisation, we have seen how even the greatest struggles, think of what happened in Egypt and of the sacrifice and heroism of people involved in it, how even those sorts of struggles can be subverted by forces that will drag in a counter-revolutionary direction and will lead to oppression and to throwing society backwards. Therefore, we have to do all those various elements as part of a movement and as part of a wider groupings in society and simultaneously and absolutely of necessity build the SWP as well. Thank you. My name's George Arthur, I'm from Barnsley, I'm one of the two South Yorkshire Freedom Riders. Hey, hey, hey. And I just want to say a few words about why the activities of a number of elderly and disabled people in South Yorkshire relates to all the things that Charlie was talking about. On the second Freedom Ride we did, one of our comrades got speaking to the driver of the train who gave him the contact details for the National Vice President of ASLEF. That uh, guy, Tosh McDonald, has now spoken at three of our rallies. Uh, ASLEF has given us contributions on three separate occasions towards producing leaflets. They invited us to the National Council. We've made a deliberate effort to go out and contact uh, trade unions. Tony and I are faced with sort of like a court case at the moment. Unite the Union has uh, undertaken paying for our legal defence. They've paid for coaches to be taken to the protest outside the court uh, that took place last Monday. Len McCluskey, speaking to the Unite Conference, actually referred to the Freedom Riders and one of our comrades here actually forced a motion onto the agenda paper which was passed unanimously in support of the Freedom Riders. The way that the party relates an activity of a load of elderly and disabled people relating to the unions is really key and crucial. Charlie came up with the idea that we launch an open letter and try and get as many leading figures within the trade union movement to sign that and we've got the General Secretaries of the UCU, of ASLEF, of uh, UNITE, of a whole range of unions, the Deputy General Secretary of the NUT, that board's passing round if people can sign it as it goes round today. And the fact that that's happened is really crucial because we've been able to say to people involved in our campaign, look, we're getting that support from the unions. When it came to Thursday last week, we argued we had to repay that support to people demonstrating in Barnsley. We had a really large contingent of Freedom Riders wearing the Freedom Riders t-shirts turning up. And at the rally at the end, every trade union speaker that got up started off by saying how inspirational the Freedom Riders were. Now, I think that's great that we've inspired them. And it needs to be the case that the fact that we've taken activity makes them think that we haven't got economic power as elderly and disabled people, but if the trade unions use their economic power of further strike action, then they can win for the trade union movement, but also win for people like us, who are past fighting in the unions now, but we need our benefits supporting as well. Okay, um, my name is Joshua Brown and I am in Glasgow, uh, not at the moment, but I come from Glasgow, <laughs> sort of. Um, I just want to give you a report of what the SWP is doing in Scotland at the moment in what Charlie rightfully described as probably the most political period um, in generations in Scotland. Every night of the week, and this is no exaggeration, every night of the week there are hundreds if not over a thousand people attending meetings about Scottish independence all over the country. We have days in Glasgow when there are four meetings on at the same time and the comrades get out to the meetings, contribute in the discussions, sell our pamphlet, which is a fantastic thing. We've sold, I don't know if this is a new record for the SWP, but we've sold 2,000 copies of our pamphlet called Yes to Independence, No to Nationalism. And there is a woman here with us um, at Marxism uh, this weekend who was a member of the SNP, bought our pamphlet outside a meeting where Tommy Sheridan spoke, booked herself up for Marxism, turned up here at the picnic, on um, Friday and said, hello, um, I want to join the SWP. I didn't, 
the things that the SNP were saying were good, but not enough. And when she read the pamphlet, she booked herself up for Marxism. That's the kind of thing that we have been doing, the kind of injection of politics and the broadening of the political discussion that is part of independence. And that's crucial because there are so many in Scotland right now who are saying, let's just get a yes vote for independence and we'll talk about politics after the 18th of September. And we say that is an absolute recipe for disaster because the SNP has already reversed its policy on leaving NATO. They're happy to stay in now. And the next thing in line would be to hang on to Trident in some kind of deal to keep the pound or something like that. But we are building a grassroots army of people who demand more. The working class has very high aspirations in Scotland right now, and that's a fantastic thing. We have bringing a broader politics to that. We organized at 36 hours notice, 200 plus demonstration against Britain first, first appearance anywhere in the UK that they announced in advance. 36 hours, over 250 people, trade union banners, young Asians, uh, people from the independence campaign, SWP members, UAF members, all together, and Britain First was not able to come to the place they said they would be. They were not able to be there. <laughs> Around Palestine, it was 48 hours notice, not, this, not yesterday, but a week ago on Saturday, we organized a demonstration at, at 48 hours notice, over 250 people in the pedestrian area in the city centre of Glasgow, and infusing the politics of Scottish Jews for a just peace, activists fighting for, independent, for freedom in Syria, as well as the, ordinary, the normal voices around Palestine. Now, yesterday, while we were here at, in, in, in Marxism, we helped organize a demonstration in Glasgow for Palestine between two and 4,000 people met in Buchanan Street, marched several miles to the BBC and held a massive demonstration outside the BBC and called for other demonstrations to come in the future. It was filmed by Independence Live, the first non-independence event that has been live streamed by them. We've been building UTR, attending the picket lines, bringing union banners there. We've developed a whole new layer of activists inside the party from the students as well as from the wider independence movement who will become SWP members in the future. Just three things. Firstly, I completely agree with what Josh was just saying about how encouraging the situation is for us in Scotland. In Edinburgh, where I come from, uh, my name is Gordon Davy. In the S campaign, we have been involved in, uh, four weeks ago in Nidri, a working class part of Edinburgh, there were 200 people canvassing for a yes vote. And we were there, we sold the paper, we gave out leaflets, we sold our independence pamphlet. <coughs> we were well received, no one objected us to being there. We were welcomed. Uh, two weeks ago in my area, a very working class area of Edinburgh, New House, 50 people campaigning, five SVP members selling the paper and the rest, and very well involved in that campaign. But a couple of things that are a bit less encouraging, uh, first of all, there's an organisation in Scotland since early last year called Radical Independence Campaign, which we're fully involved in. But four weeks ago, uh, two of our members went to the RIC meeting and they proposed that at the next election there should be a united organisation of all the left in Scotland to campaign for policies outside the Labour Party, the left of the Labour Party. Only our members voted for the resolution. Everyone else voted against it. And it seemed to be, at least from some people, that the problem for them was that we would be involved, we the SDVP. So there is a hostility there from some people to a United Left organisation which we would be part of. My reaction to that is, I would say, well go ahead with the United Left organisation in the election. If you don't want us involved, we will campaign separately. Where we're not standing a candidate, we will urge people to support your organisation. We shouldn't take it as a no, a complete no. We should encourage it and promote it. Lastly, uh, one small point for me about as to it being meetings. Our meetings in Edinburgh are generally quite small. Quite often it's just members. The problem is when people come into the room who are not members, we just carry on as if nothing has changed. <laughs> I think the people who come to the meeting who are not members are the most important people in the room. We have to address what they're saying. We have to address their questions very seriously. We have to debate and discuss with them very sympathetically, encourage them to say what they disagree about or what their doubts are, encourage them to come next week, but not jump on them with every disagreement, saying, no, you're wrong about that because that's not the way to go. Every time someone comes through the door that is not a member, we have to cultivate them and encourage them and make sure they do not leave without our phone numbers, that encourage them to get involved in an activity with us, to come to the next meeting, and the rest must be taken very, very seriously. Every possible new member is vital.
Hi, my name is Aisha. I'm from Edinburgh. I also like to follow on from the last two speakers about the independence campaign. One of the things is uh, we're involved in the Yes campaign and we're also involved in radical independence campaign. And uh, yeah, some of the Yes campaigns, which is a big broad campaign, but it's got grassroots groups and working class communities. And um, we have Super Saturdays, like what the last two previous um, speakers said, and masses of people turn up. We've got young people talking about things like rights for trans women, for LGBT people. We've got women involved in the campaign. We've got trade unionists for independence. Um, we've got people from the SNP. So, uh, and um, so we've been canvassing on the doorsteps and we've been taking up arguments and challenges that we face on the doorstep. For example, things like what will happen to the currency? What will happen to the oil? So we say things like, well, you know, Scotland can have its own currency. We want to nationalise the banks. We want to get rid of bonuses for bankers, basically. We want to nationalise all the industries and br bring them under democratic control. We've been taking up, up arguments about immigration, about UKIP and stuff like that. And um, a socialist worker has been playing an important role in providing those arguments for working class people to bring a clarity of thought, basically. And uh, we've been using our um, uh, pamphlet, sorry, pamphlet and the uh, fact sheet to provide arguments for people, basically. So they vote yes. And one of the things that happened in my locality is we, d d we got £500 in donations from somebody who done a cycle race and we've also been offered to, uh, to put up a stall in the super uh, Asda place and <laughs> but we've decided to take up the offer because they said we can have it for four weeks before the independence campaign on the premises so it's a great opportunity for us to put where a lot of young people and working class people go to um, do the shopping, we can put that, that argument forward and we can have a co conversation with them at the same time about socialism. So um, the campaigns are very vibrant and it's really taken off in Scotland. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Charlie Horn, I'm a member of Revolution Socialism in the 21st century. And I really just wanted to ask a couple of questions of Charlie um, based on um, unison, because the reality is I think it's important to have a realistic approach to um, Thursday and one of the key things that certainly for Unison is it was much much weaker than N30. It was only local government, it, it excluded people who have been uh, privatised out of local government, so in a number of councils where the housing department has gone over to an arm's length management organisation, they weren't balloted, staff who work in academies weren't balloted, I'm in the community sector. Some people in community were balloted for November 30. No one at all in the community service group, which is the third largest service group in Unison, was, was balloted. And was absolutely no mention of linking up the live ballot in health with the action. And the reality is that it's quite difficult to see the mechanism by which we are going to put sufficient pressure on the Unison leadership in order to try and in order to try in order to try and sh turn that turn that around, and particularly, it's quite difficult to see how in health that where in health that pressure is going to come from, given the real, very real difficulties on on the ground in on the, on the ground in health. And I think it's important to I absolutely agree with what Charlie said about what the aim, but I'd like to hear a little bit more about how in practice that's how in practice that, that's going to be done. And I think there are you know the equal, I'm sure people from other unions could talk about. The second thing is the second thing is the electoral question because um, again at Unison Conference people got very very big cheers when they talked about when they denounced the Labour Party in particular when they talked about Unison ceasing to fund the Labour Party but equally people got very very big cheers when they talked about the necessity for the Labour Party going back to its roots when people talked about old Labour and the arguments about old Labour so I think it's Although people are very unhappy with it, it would be wrong to see that as a simple rejection of old Labour. And what we didn't find at Unison Conference was any serious enthusiasm for either Tusk or for um, Left Unity. And I just wanted again to say, I mean, it's very difficult to look at the recent election results for Tusk and not think those didn't work. And I just wonder whether there's any rethinking going on about that.
See, we do, we do have to look at, the, uh, um, um, uh, 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 at some of the difficulties of the period, but actually that is not the place to start is, actually, what a brilliant strike it was on Thursday, and actually how activists can take the calls that are made for whatever it is, whatever crumbs it is that we get and turn it into something bigger. And actually, one of the ways in which our comrades organised around the run-up to the strike, particularly in schools, was that they organised joint meetings between NUT and Unison and other unions that were involved in the strikes in their schools. And this is something, by the way, that quite often happened only where uh, members of the SWP were in schools making that happen. Because we didn't start from the pessimism and the miserabilism, we started from how brilliant it was that we were going to have this joint strike. And the effect of that, if you talk about units of members in academies that were not balloted, is that in one school in, in, in Hackney, where a comrade organised a joint meeting with Unison, which was an academy where the Unison members had not been balloted, five Unison members refused to cross the picket line and joined the strike action anyway. And that, I think, begins to give you a glimpse of what you can do if you start with the possibility of action and then say, how can we make the most of it? How can we generalise this? And then you can go on to talk about the problems in terms of what do we do about escalation, what do we do about strengthening rank and file organisation, what do we do about taking the struggle, the struggle forward, you see. And I think when you talk about United Resistance, Charlie is absolutely right, that I'm convinced there is a potential there for people who want that struggle to go forward um, uh, uh, and, and escalate and generalise, and how do we actually start to organise that? And I think it's a duty, really, upon us as as revolutionaries in the workplace and socialists in the workplace to start to take that question seriously and therefore to build the United Resistance Conference now on November the 15th to start to think about who we know because the process of now talking to the people that you know the people that you were on the picket line with the people that you went on the dem you've been on the demonstrations with the other trade unionists that you were on the joint rallies with in your locality beginning to talk to them now about the fact that we want escalation, that we don't want the argument about the Labour Party to hold us back, we don't want the argument about the trade union laws to hold us back, political arguments. So when we talk about building United Resistance, it's a combination of delivering real solidarity to workers in struggle, talking concretely about actually how we can escalate those strikes, and also trying to create a bit of attention around some of the political arguments about the role of the trade union leadership, the role of the Labour Party and so on, which means absolutely having committed uh, 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 members of a revolutionary party at the core of that, but being able to reach out to other people and talk absolutely concretely about how we do that. And that, I think that is a duty upon us in the present time to make sure that we build this conference really as big as possible. In the course of having the arguments and discussions about why people should come to it, you can also begin to talk concretely with them about what they're going to do. What are we going to do to try and make sure the strikes happen in September? How are we going to build the pickets? How are we going to how are we going to build the rallies and how are we going to take the struggle forward? And I think we should be optimistic there are a layer of people around us that we can pull into those debates and we want to get them to build the conference but also to, to join the SWP and to be part of actually politically taking that strategy forward. Uh, John Molyneux from Irish SWP. Um, my intention was to reinforce uh, two points that Charlie made, one about Scottish, the importance of Scottish independence and secondly about the electoral initiative. Now, the question of Scottish independence, it's obvious that the comrades are really stuck into this and have grasped this point, may not need written. But I just want to emphasise from uh, what international significance this has. Uh, I scarcely dare hope for a, 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 a yes vote <laughs> because, be, because it would be so fantastic in terms of its international... Uh, it, will, it will completely shape up politics in Ireland. Uh, if, if, uh, if Scotland were to become independent. I mean, the consequences are almost incalculable. And it will have an effect around the world to see Imperial Britain breaking up. This will affect uh, everywhere from uh, the Middle East to Catalonia and so on. So I just, there's a lot at stake in that. The other point on the electoral uh, uh, intervention. Of course, as we all know, that we are not electoralists. Uh, there is no parliamentary road to socialism and so on. But having a significant electoral intervention, as Lenin stressed, is extremely important. 
and uh, not doing so really opens the, the door to the right wing. So I want to, I want to back up everything that Charlie was saying about, uh, about that. Just a couple of things, I think from experience uh, in Ireland where we've had a, a very successful electoral uh, intervention over the last um, uh, few months, we've got 15 councils elected and so on. Our situation is enormously easier because of, um, you don't have to deal with first past the post, you've got proportional representation. I'm not saying why can't you do what, like what we did because we've got great advantages and your Labour Party stands at 30% and now stands at about 4 or 5%, so it's a different ballgame. But there are some things that I, I think that we have to learn to do from my experience in Britain. And that is, I think we have to learn how to turn our candidates into tribunes of the people in localities. Too often I've seen as we run candidates who kind of, they don't really want to run, oh, I'm just, you know, I'm just doing this to put out a few leaflets. They have to learn how to be the person who backs every local campaign uh, uh, and really emerges as somebody who people who are struggling in, lo in the localities look to uh, and see the election campaign as part of their struggles against the bedroom tax or against wh whatever else it would, would be. And I'm shameless about this, I know, but if you want to see an account of how that was done in West Belfast by Jerry Carroll, you can read the Irish Marxist through. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. But it is actually useful reading for anybody who's thinking of uh, standing as a candidate. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, a couple of speakers ago talked about some of the difficulties post uh, July the 10th and how we're we going to do it and how can we possibly get action in the future and won't it be a disaster in the, in the National Health Service if they, if they, uh, if they ballot and so on and so forth. And there's no question, there are weaknesses. There is no question about it. Inside the hospital union organisation isn't, you know, we're not talking about 100% density far from it. But if our starting point is that we really can't win a ballot inside the health service, if our starting point is the difficulties, then I think we're sort of, in a sense, waving up the, the, the white flag. And I tell you, in the build-up to July the 10th, there was a problem on the left inside Unison, which was large sections of the left inside Unison said, you know what, they've called a strike, we know what Prentice will do, we've been here before, they're going to sell us out, What's the point? And actually sounded worse than Prentice. In practice, did very little to build that strike. And therefore, you know, to our credit, with the actual FWP, actually we didn't fall into that trap. We seized the opportunity. We saw that Prentice was open the door ajar. We want to kick it through, not code it shut again, saying don't bother, not welcome in here. And therefore, when we seize any sort of opportunity, we have to sort of grab it. Because one of the things you learn and you go to meetings at Marx and so forth is revolutionary parties cannot be built outside the struggle and outside the movement. It cannot be built simply on the question of having the right ideas in the abstract. The right ideas are very, very important, no question about it. If we are not ideologically clear, then we're in, in, in deep trouble. But if we're a party that seeks to actually mobilise people has to be at the heart of the struggle. And actually, you know, when Charlie lists the dates coming up, you're like, we're in the heart of the struggle, you know, and it's going to be a struggle to be in all of those things, and that's, that's a good place to be. With all the difficulties which we discussed last night, the party has to root itself right in the centre of, of, of that struggle, and I think, therefore, UTR is very, very important. One thing I noticed in Bristol, our demonstration was 3,500, 4,000. Quite young, uh, quite militant, but I, 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 I think a more improved reception to discussing with people about actually that we need to come together to have those debates. They may not agree with everything we say, and I, there is a looming argument of how we go forward. Unite are going to put forward a strategy of no more national days of action, selective only. We'll do what they did in Southampton, bring out little sections and whatever. And you have Unison, formally, saying we're going to bring out the NHS and we want uh, coordinate action. How ironic that the so-called right union actually formally is to the left. And those people on the left who really thought that Unite was the only game in town, and this was the <coughs> great thing, have actually been caught on the hop. And I'll leave it there. Uh, Helen Davis, uh, Unison. I am on the NEC, and uh, Barnet, Unison. It's awkward to stand here. Um, just take it out of the holder. Push up. Oh, that's there we go. Um, <clears throat> OK, so uh, my branch, uh, uh, the experience of the strike, had some difficulties with it um, for some of the reasons Charlie outlined, but 
I'm going to put it into some perspective. When I first became a uh, branch chair and started working more in the, in the union office, there was a national strike, I, think, I, can't, I, can, no, I get them mixed up, it was about 2008, 9 and the calls into our office then, 50% um, of them were, I'm not sure about going on strike, don't think I can afford it, <coughs> da, 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 da. it was quite difficult arguments across the board, arguing for people to take strike action. Contrast that with our experience in the union office this time round, and it's been, why haven't we been balloted? We want to go out. You know, it's a complete change. And I think it is important to, to discuss and think about what, how we do bring more people out. We did discuss, you know, the possibility of any, you know, how to get around the academy question, because that has been a bit of a disaster in, for Unison. Um, in terms of then asking NUT, GMB to put on the picket lines to picket our members out. And we had agreements from management that people wouldn't be individually victimised as a consequence. So I think we, you know, whatever scenario we're given, we do have to make the most of what we've got and really make the most of it. And the argument we had in our branch and to get people involved we, we actually, I, I thought, thought, you know, nobody, because of our past experience, our key activists will not go with an argument which is one day out and we will have a pay rise. Rather, we argued, if you want to send a message to your local management about how organised you are, whether they can roll you over on salaries, on restructures, on everything else, you have to be out. It is important because our managers will go for the place of the least resistance and that argument did work you know because irrespective of whether there is more action or not the clear message is from from our membership is we wanted to be out to show our local management what the what we can do and i think it is about thinking how to how to get around some of the obstacles that are put in our way in a more creative fashion and and, and bring people with us Well, I'll try and do my best, comrades. Um, I actually want to start, and it's uh, listening to the discussion and Charlie's thoughtful presentation. It's great. Everybody, I'm sure, has heard the famous uh, uh, slogan of, of, of Gramsci, optimism of the will, pessimism of the intellect. I think it was the strap line for Avanti. Um, and, of course, it's a wonderful slogan, but the issue is how do you actually get the balance between the two? How do you make the, the dialectic, if you like, productive. I mean, I don't know about you, but I have met a number of comrades on the left, I'm um, in the SWP, and we have one or two in SWP, but who are relentlessly optimistic, uh, and it can get pretty exhausting. <laughs> There's a, a judgment about, well, when do you pause and think about these things, and how do you fo focus and prioritise? And of course, at the other end, much more common, you get the pessimism of the intellect, uh, the seepage away of the enthusiasm, the cynicism, the passivity, the move into the Labour Party, but more, but more usually pass, um, passivity. And it's how you actually bring those two together in a, in a productive relationship. And I just wanted to say a bit about Leeds. I'm conscious that the chair is from Leeds, and Charlie mentioned uh, Leeds and the parliamentary uh, candidate, and I'm sure we welcome that, and we'll discuss it with great interest in, in Leeds, Charlie. Um, the, I just wanted to say a few, if you like, pessimism, the intellect things uh, about uh, Leeds. And the basic message is that there is loads to do, loads of struggle to get involved in. The Freedom Ride is just on the, the border of us. Brilliant struggle going on there. Great turnout, July the 10th. Oh, really? oh my God. I had nine, um, not nine points, I hate it. Nine, nine, nine organisations in Leeds who uh, uh, I, I have been more or less active uh, in. UAF, we have a core of about half a dozen. When there's a crisis, of course, we can produce hundreds and hundreds, and, and the UKIP, hopefully, we'll get a, 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 a core of about 20 or 30, but the, the, the continuous core, four or five, and that's so throughout the Green Movement, Left Unity, Good Meeting on Scotland, 20 people at it. There's always a golden rule, they have an trial, you can't get above that 25 in Leeds of committed activists. Uh, PCS, which is my union, people would say, what a great union to be in. You know, so many good comrades. 
Uh, somebody yawning there is a good response, I guess. The, uh, uh, I've, I've been uh, involved in that union since 1969, and uh, the left conference this year, merger with Unite, etc., 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 70, uh, a national, national conference, uh, and it just sort of underlines uh, the difficulties we face and the need to focus. And I have three uh, points, very brief, one, one word, the struggle which people have spoken about so great. And I'm a retired member of PCS, and we did great on July the 10th, going around picket lines, often only one person there from the office, and they were, it was great for them to see us retired members. Organisation, I wasn't in SWP for many years. Uh, part of the reason I survived is because I'm stubborn, uh, and I won't let the bastards grind me down. But the other reason was I had a very good, thorough education at the beginning, in the 60s, and, and particularly in the 60s and also the 70s, of, of education classes, very tough, Marxism, pamphlets, etc., and that stayed uh, with me. And I think, do think, within the midst of the struggle, we do have to consider issues like education. Cheers. Charlie, to sum up, please. Thank you, Charlie. Yeah, I want to start with the, uh, the question of the struggle and how we put union leaders, which is an important element. There's a formal uh, requirement. We should raise motions inside our union branches and shop stewards committees and reps meetings and so on. It's important to do it. It starts the discussion going and puts a bit of pressure on the people at the top of the union. Uh, we should also encourage all those other people who came to the picket lines, DPAC, uh, the bedroom tax groups, to also bombard the union leaders. Let the Freedom Riders say, fantastic, for the support you got. We thought 10th of July was wonderful. Let's do it again soon. Uh, all of those sorts of things are helpful. The question of local strikes is important. I have no doubt that one of the pressures on the union leaders towards 10th of July was the fact that there had been a number of local strikes, nearly all of which had been successful. And therefore, if you can win at local level, why can't we do it on a national level? And therefore, all of the strikes that are, in, that are taking place at the moment uh, from Lambeth College to King's College uh, are incredibly important in terms of ramping up the pressure on the union bureaucracy because they demonstrate workers' readiness to fight when an official lead is given. This is very, very important uh, to do, it seems to me. And we have to build, unite the resistance. Uh, the conference, as comrades have said, on the 15th of November, but also at a local level to push for unite the resistance to get stronger. Now, it's not nearly strong enough. Of course, we recognise that. But you don't get to where you want to be unless you make an effort to actually do it and try it out in practice. So we have to try it and experiment and work with others around that sort of question in order to push it forward. And we shouldn't think that we can't sometimes shift the bureaucracy. Two examples I want to give. One is the firefighters. A dispute which incredibly has been going on for three years over pensions. On a number of occasions, the FBU officials have tried to end it. On each occasion, there has been a revolt from below involving rank-and-file firefighters, yes, but with a middling layer of the bureaucracy as well, which has prevented them doing it. And the level of action hasn't reached that which is required, but, you know, they've had to call, what is it, 15 episodes of action uh, in the next eight days uh, in the latest round of the firefighters' dispute. Simon Hickman, one of our comrades in Manchester, because there were no demonstrations called on the last firefighters strike, called a demonstration in Manchester, essentially with himself and some other activists, they got 300 firefighters on it. That sort of initiative is what's required, and it can force the bureaucracy to move in some cases. The second example I want to use is the merger of PCS and Unite. An attempt was made to push through the merger of PCS and Unite on an undemocratic basis and also would have meant that PCS's position of supporting candidates outside the Labour Party would have been submerged inside Unite. Now, we and other activists work together to say, we don't want to go down that road, thank you very much. We quite like the idea of being able to stand candidates outside the Labour Party. And because of that, the merger has not gone through. Now, both the bureaucracies, the PCS bureaucracy and the Unite bureaucracy, were very keen on this going through without anyone really raising any objection to it. Now the objection has been raised, and it will only go through if the political <coughs> affiliation the independence of, uh, of PCS is preserved, with a, uh, along with a number of other conditions. This is important because we don't need pessimism of the internet, pessimism of the will. Uh, in other words, you know, things are tough, 
uh, it's better not to do anything. Um, no, we have, we have to be realistic. God, it is tough out there. I've said very clearly there will be a political battle about whether the, the strikes are resumed after 10th of July on anything like the level that's required. But there are a number of things which we have to try and do about it. We have to push, push, push at the basis of the union and in every arena in which we're involved. I very much agree with what John Molyneux said about elections and about candidates. There is a sort of thing, either the person says, I don't really want to do it, but I'm the weakest person, so I'll be the candidate, <laughs> or that people say the ideal candidate is the Unison Branch Secretary. Now, you know, I, many of my best friends are Unison Branch Secretaries, but <laughs> nonetheless, in general, you, the Unison Branch Secretary is not the best known person in a locality. I'm sorry, that's the truth. Um, you know, we have to think about, and it's one of the reasons why we ought to select the candidate soon, by the way. We ought to get someone who knows that she or he, in eight months' time, is going to be the candidate. And therefore, she or he can write to the local paper, they can be in the campaigns, they can take a leading role, you can put them up on a platform when there's a local demonstration or whatever. She or he has to know that they are going to become, in as far as it's possible, someone who is known inside every campaign, inside every community group, inside every pensioners group, and every residence group, goes around, meets people, hello, I'm the prospective parliamentary candidate for Tusk or whatever it is in Hackney South or whatever, I'd like to speak to you about what you want, about what we're going to do and so on. Someone has to do that. Much better than three weeks before, some unwilling person being press ganged to do it. Uh, resentment is not a great basis for an election <laughs> campaign. So let's try and do that. I mean, I'm not talking about running 600 candidates. But we ought to be thinking, getting 12, 15 candidates of party members who are going to stand in Britain. It's quite, you know, it's not saying we're going to hurl ourselves into the election campaign, but think what the election campaign will be like. It will be intensely ideological, there will be a huge argument between Labour and the Tories, of course. And of course the main divide will be between Labour and the Tories, and it will squeeze the far left vote. Of course it will. Of course it will. But it will be a chance to put forward an alternative, and it will also say, in contrast to the politics of division and racism and scapegoating and UKIP, we stand for a united working class challenge against the bastards at the top of society. That's not a bad thing to spend a month going on the knocker and talking to people about. I'd look forward to doing that. We have to look forward to doing it as well. I'm thinking it's a positive thing to build a wider campaign and other, uh, other resistance in our community. Finally, the point I might make uh, about Leeds, I'll say two things. I have a magic solution, which is to get bigger. Um, that's the answer to your problem, Mike. Um, that's quite difficult, as we all know. But I'll also say, I mean, you know, we heard a number of comrades from Scotland speak. Two years ago, Glasgow was weaker than Leeds. That's the honest truth, and people in Glasgow won't, won't mind me saying it. It's been through a very difficult period. A number of people had left the organisation. Now. Glasgow feels a very vibrant, lively place at the centre of the resistance. Now, it's not because there's something magical about the Scots. It is because we recruited some students, we worked alongside other people, we got involved in everything that happened, and we raised revolutionary politics inside it. And to be honest, that's not a magic solution, but in most places it works if we can apply it effectively enough. And I'm very confident that in Leeds, or anywhere else, we can do those sorts of things because there is a deep need for an alternative in society, and global society, and in Britain as well. There are numbers of people who recognise that we need to get together to fight for a different sort of world. Now, we have to make the SWP good enough uh, for those people to feel they want to.